Great. Thanks, Ravi. Yep. Thanks for pestering me. Um, so this is joint work with Jong Suk Oh in uh, Seoul. And it's on the archive, although there's lots of sign errors in that, and uh, we'll update it in a week or so. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, mainly this is going to be a talk about um, characteristic classes, basically, for orthogonal bundles, so bundles with a quadratic form. Um, and the applications <coughs> to counting Calabi-Yau fourfolds will just come at the end a bit briefly. Uh, so. I'm going to talk, review quadratic bundles, oriented quadratic bundles, and then talk about the uh, square root Euler class. And just as a normal Euler class, so that'll be a characteristic class in Chow cohomology. Um, and just as the ordinary Euler class of a bundle can be localized to the zeros of any section, which I will review using Fulton McPherson intersection theory. Um, these classes can be localized or we show how to localize them to zero the zero locus of an isotropic section so that turns out to be the right thing to do um, so isotropic is that the quadratic form evaluated on the section and itself uh, is zero but i will come to all that um, and that will lead to as i'll explain briefly a way of defining an algebraic virtual cycle on moduli of sheaves on Calabi R fourfolds. And uh, this should be compared to um, uh, a real virtual cycle defined in homology using real derived differential geometry by Boris Off and Joyce. And our class passes from Chow to homology to give their class modulo an issue with Z mod, uh, with inverting two in the coefficients, but I'll come to that. Uh, and then I will talk about the K-theoretic. So this was all the cohomological version. Then I'll talk about the K-theoretic version. So there's also a K-theoretic Euler class, which I'll review, a square root Euler class that we define, a way of localizing it to the zero locus of an isotropic section. And this gives us a way of defining, instead of a virtual cycle in Chow homology, a virtual cycle in K-theory, uh, as I'll explain. And then there's a virtual Riemann rock theorem relating the two. And there's a torus localization formula for each. So that's really the big advantage of our treatment over Boris Huff and Joyce is it's much more computable because it's algebraic and it's not horrible differential geometry and real numbers and things like that. OK, uh, any questions before I begin proper? Is uh, You can hear me. The link's OK. Yep, everything sounds good. Okay. Should, should we have seen this square root? I feel like I should have seen this square root, uh, uh, this thing sort of before. You're, it looks like a really natural thing. Is yeah, it isn't any, it nice? Is it... <clears throat> I, I think, um, firstly, the dead in Graham should have called it square root Euler class. A good notation is always important. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it really, it, there's, there's also something you, you probably heard of is the polish up Weintraub class. Um, that's more like the K-theoretic version that I'm going to discuss. Um, yeah, I don't know. I will review it anyway. You can see if you're familiar with it or not. OK. Um, um, one thing I should say is don't, don't get confused between sheaves on calabi owls and orthogonal bundles that, you know, the sheaves I'm counting on Calabi hours are not orthogonal bundles. It's the, the local model of the moduli space of sheaves, semi-stable or stable sheaves on the Calabi hour fourfold that I will describe in terms of an auxiliary orthogonal bundle. So the two things shouldn't be confused. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I will it, will, it will be obvious later where orthogonal bundles come up um, in moduli of bundles on calabi r fourfolds. But more or less, it's something to do with said duality on x2 from a sheaf to itself on um, calabi r fourfold being a symmetric thing, which gives you an orthogonal structure on, on the x2 vector space. But we, we will come to that later. OK, so uh, as I say, 60 or 70 percent of this talk at least will be just about characteristic classes for orthogonal bundles. So we're going to work over any complex quasi-projective scheme. 
uh, we'll have a vector bundle, holomorphic or algebraic vector bundle on this scheme. They're the same thing by Gaga. So it'll be Zariski locally trivial. And it, we're always going to have a vector bundle with a quadratic form. Okay, so and it's going to be non-degenerate. And then by the usual Gram-Schmidt process, um, you can find an orthonormal basis of sections locally uh, for this bundle. But because it uses square roots, that you can only do it locally analytically or etal locally. So um, what you find is that orthogonal bundles, the orthogonal structure is not Zariski locally trivial in general. So they correspond to um, ATAR locally trivial principle ORC bundles. So ORC is the just the um, complex matrices which preserve the standard quadratic form on C to the R. So that's the natural symmetry group here. Okay, um, so that's an orthogonal bundle. It's just a bundle with a quadratic form on each fiber, varying algebraically. Um, so a special orthogonal bundle, this is a little bit tricky and this leads to all kinds of signs and really don't get too upset by them. Um, if you ever needed them, you could look in the paper or someone else's paper. Uh, and the key is just to know that the signs can all be dealt with. But I will, for completeness, go through the signs. They'll get worse. They're, they're okay on this slide. So this quadratic form, the first thing to notice is it gives an isomorphism from the bundle to its dual. Okay, so taking any element of it, E here, um, taking the bilinear form associated to Q with that E gives me a dual, uh, a covector, a, a section of E dual, which I can evaluate on another E2. So I would get Q E1, E2. Okay, so I end up with a, a map from E to E dual, and that's an isomorphism, that's the non degeneracy condition. So in particular, their determinants are equal. And so E has not necessarily trivial determinant, but its square is trivial. And then an orientation is definition, um, a trivialization of the determinant of E, which is compatible with this trivialization star here. So um, it's a Z mod two choice because it has to be just compatible because of this condition star and it has to be compatible with star. So it's not, it's not just, it's not the same thing as a trivialization of debt E. That would be a C star choice. It's really a Z mod two choice. Okay. So that's the passage from ORC to SORC. Um, and so what you find is that oriented orthogonal bundles, so that's a bundle with a quadratic form and an orientation in this sense, are the things which correspond ATAR locally to um, principal SORC bundles. So SORC is the symmetry group of C to the R with standard quadratic form and orientation. Now, uh, this page uses the real numbers, so I appreciate that all offend most of you, uh, but it's just for motivation. So <clears throat> orthogonal bundles admit maximal real positive definite subbundles, and they're unique up to homotopy. Okay, so th this is this is a real subbundle on which the quadratic form is real and positive definite. Okay, so it's just a standard um, inner product. So for instance, on C to the R with coordinates, complex coordinates, Z1 up to Z to the R, the standard quadratic form would be this, some Z, J squared. I should be checking actually, can I cursor? Yeah, we can see yeah. the cursor. Okay, right. Um, and inside that, I could take the real R to the R inside C to the R. So I just take all the ZIs to be real. Okay. So the quadratic form in terms of real variables, x, x, j, and y, j, where z, j is x, j plus i, y, j, the quadratic form looks like this. And you can see if I set all the y's to zero and just move in x space, I get a real half dimensional subspace on which the quadratic form just becomes some x, j squared. So it's positive, definite, all the y, j's have gone, and all the imaginary part is gone as well. Okay, so that 
that's point wise what a maximal real um, positive definite subspace looks like and it's not unique you can there are there are families of them but up to homotopy it's unique so the space of them is is uh, contractible all right and then conversely if you have a real bundle with a real inner product on it uh, then you can just complexify everything and you end up with a complex bundle of twice the or with the same complex dimension or twice the real dimension uh, with now a complex quadratic form on and it'll be positive definite and real on this piece er and it'll be negative definite and real on this piece and then the cross on, in between it'll be complex and so this is reflecting the fact that there's a homotopy equivalence between <coughs> orc which retracts back onto orr so um up to homotopy um either of these descriptions are equivalent you can have a a complex um so or a complex quadratic bundle or a real bundle they're, they're, they're the same data up to homotopy okay and there's also a homotopy equivalence between the two special orthogonal groups and so what that means is that an orientation on the complex bundle in the sense of the previous slide must be equivalent to an orientation on the real bundle in the sense of actual orientations as we um, are taught them when we're young. And uh, you see Zoom is interfering with my slides. You can probably see my slide, but I can't because Zoom is trying to take up some of my screen. Okay. Uh, so yeah, in, in a local orthonormal basis of sections, um, then this correspondence is very easy. So um, it turns out that if I just wedge together an orthonormal basis of complex sections, uh, sorry, of real sections, then I do get an orientation in the sense of one or two slides ago. And the real orientation is just what you, you just take the wedge over the real numbers instead. Okay, so that's easy. But later it will get more complicated. Does anyone know how I get rid of the, how I tell Zoom to disappear into the background and stop putting bars up on my screen? This happens to me all the time, and I I usually just fiddle about and it goes away, and I don't know how. But someone else might actually know. Hmm. So it's down at the bottom of my screen, and then I can't read the bottom slides. Then I move it up. Anyway, as long as you can't see it. Okay, so now let me just go back. So uh, these bundles up to homotopy are the same thing as real special orthogonal bundles. And real special orthogonal bundles have Euler classes. And I'm going to take the rank now to be R to be even because those Euler classes for odd rank bundles, those Euler classes are two torsion because the bundles isomorphic to is dual. So let's ignore that. So we're going to fix R is 2N from now on. We're with SO2NC bundles and just say, well, associated to that up to homotopy, there's a unique real bundle, which it's the complexification of. And so I can take its Euler class and I just get a topological characteristic class of my quadratic bundle, E, that I started with by taking this Euler class of its real form. And it satisfies the following that roughly speaking it's square is the Euler class as in the top churn class of my original complex bundle um, why is that what's that why does that sign come in um, that's the first sign that will come in uh, that's because the orientation of the real bundle you know it was like e1 wedge e2 wedge e3 and so on that gives me an orientation of the complexified bundle which would look like e1 wedge e2 etc wedge with ie1 wedge ie2 and that's different when you move those i the second set of basis vectors back and commute them back because really you want to write things in terms of e1 plus ie1 you can imagine you're moving a lot of um things through wedge products and so you get a sign and so it's just because a certain orientation differs from a complex orientation 
Isn't it because if when oh, you sorry, complexify anyway. the bundle, you get the bundle plus it's dual or not? Yeah, that's, that, that, thank you, um, Eleni, much better. There you go. Yeah. And, and, and can I ask, as I'm trying to uh, think about why I should have seen this before, uh, it, it's yeah. presume is it presumably in, it, was there a paper of Bert Totaro's that involved like the early on when he was introducing these things where you find the cohomology of BSO and then he's, you sort of describe it explicitly and boom, this class turns up. Oh, I, damn it. <laughs> okay, you're on seven. Yes, uh, uh, Rebecca Veal <laughs> and uh, yes. Uh, uh, okay, great. So, uh, so, the, so uh, but but the, but the um, but then the reason that um, presumably Edison and Graham didn't say it in this natural way is because of this, the real number. I mean, the non-algebraic, uh, non-algebraically, it's it's natural the way you described it, whereas it, it's kind of more of a surprise. Where did this come from? If you're trying to live fully over the complex numbers, right. absolutely. Yeah, that's all entirely correct. So, so um, this. So I, I was just going to say, just because, you know, we had some stuff go by in the chat, this square root doesn't seem to have anything to do with like the double covers ON or spin N of SON. It's just simply the fact that that the complexified guy is basically two copies of the of the real uh, yeah, guy. That's, that's right. That's why it is. Yeah. The oh, spin really? thing will sort of come in later, although I won't emphasize it, but not now. That's correct. Oh, there's no, there's no. OK, so that's a red okay, herring so completely. For now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so as Ravi said, so Bert Totaro and his student Rachel Field um, proved that um, this class does not is not an algebraic class, but it did in, well, there we are. It did it in Graham showed that actually, if you use, if you invert two in your coefficients, we'll see where that comes from, then you can lift it to Chow. So it is an algebraic class up to sign, and it was never clear to me. I don't think they really fixed the sign. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but we, we, the sign's extremely important for what we do, so we'll, we'll fix the sign shortly. Okay, and what they did was in place of maximal positive definite real subbundles, which is how I motivated it, they use maximal isotropic holomorphic or algebraic subbundles, so it's really an algebraic thing. Okay. So uh, that's what I've got to show you next is how they define this class. Okay, so <clears throat> a holomorphic subbundle or an algebraic subbundle of a, um, a quadratic bundle is called isotropic if the quadratic form is zero on it. And it's maximal isotropic if it's as big a dimension as possible. So that's rank n. So remember E was rank 2n. So for example, in C2, with the standard quadratic form, we, we, as we've already discussed, you can take these vectors one zero, these real vectors one zero and zero one, and they span a real positive definite subspace. But then um, isotropic vectors are, for instance, one i and one minus i. And so, yeah, the first two span a real maximal positive definite subspace, as we've discussed before, whereas these complex lines, so these are the same size notice, they're one complex dimensional or two real dimensional. The complex lines Z1 plus I Z2 and Z1 minus I Z2 um, are the only maximal isotropics. They don't, in this case, in this low, in the rank two, they don't move in families, it's just two of them because the, the quadric in P1 is two points. Okay, and when you have a maximal isotropic, then you get an exact sequence. So this is familiar more in skewed geometry rather than symmetric geometry that we're doing here where lambda would be a Lagrangian. But anyway, um, I'm sure you're familiar with this exact sequence. So um, here you would take a vector E in here and by pairing it with elements of lambda, it therefore defines an element of lambda dual. And <clears throat> lambda is the kernel of that map because lambda paired with lambda is zero. And because it's maximal, this is onto this map from E to lambda dual. So you end up with this exact sequence. All right, so what you should be thinking of is um, the standard exam, a standard example of a way to get a quadratic bundle E is just to take any vector bundle, rank n vector bundle lambda and take lambda plus lambda dual. And that has a natural quadratic structure where you pair lambda and lambda dual 
and then lambda is a maximal isotropic for that quadratic structure. But you can get non-trivial extensions as well. Okay, and this also shows you, notice, that with the same sign, the Euler class of E, uh, sorry, of lambda squares to give the Euler class of E. Okay, so this Euler class of lambda also looks a bit like a square root Euler class. Because lambda is isotropic, if you embed it in E and then project to the real maximal subbundle that we were discussing, you get an isomorphism because the only way they're the same rank, lambda and E R, and the only way you could go to zero, that something could be in the kernel, would be if lambda intersected i times e r but i times e r is negative definite and lambda is zero for the quadratic form so they don't intersect so um this is actually an isomorphism so um it's no surprise that this will work just as well as the real subbundle um to define this square root euler class if you have a maximal isotropic but in general you don't and in fact if you have a maximal isotropic then by a version of Gram-Schmidt without square roots, you'll see that E has to be the risky locally trivial. So, and there are plenty of, with its quadratic form, uh, but there are plenty of quadratic bundles which are not as risky locally trivial. Okay, so you can see we're, you know, in, in local coordinates, where, or in terms of local sections, um, before we were talking about writing things in orthonormal bases, so this form of the quadratic form, Whereas this sort of lambda and lambda dual, these maximal isotropics correspond to writing the, the orthogonal, uh, the quadratic form in this kind of form, Z1, Zn plus one plus Z2, Zn plus two and so on. And it's here in this form that the signs will be horrible, I'm afraid. So if notice you... on this slide, we haven't used the orientation anywhere. And where the orientation comes in is, <coughs> So, the actually, a bunch of, actually, we have a bunch of questions. What, when you say orientation, yeah. what do you mean in this? What is or, orientation? Is that choice of isotropic? I mean, like, is right. there a, a, so you say you have an isotropic and then you get the square root. But then I worry that maybe the other square root might come from another isotropic. Uh, right. If I paid attention to dimensions, I'd know whether like, it's in or odd. Yeah, I mean, you should you should exactly look at this example. You could use lambda, or you could use lambda dual if E right. is the direct sum. They will not give you the same square root Euler class. Right. The, there'll be a sign, and so that that's what we need to fix. We're not we're not going to choose any lambda. We're going to choose a lambda which is what's called a positive maximal isotropic. Great. So then um, there's a choice. Yeah. But, but then and then you, are you also saying that the quadratic bundle? You have this issue of these things not being as risky locally trivial, only tau locally trivial. And that issue is precisely the choice of the quadratic uh, of that isotropic. Is that the thing exactly which tells you whether it's risky trivial or not? No, no. That, it only goes in one direction. If it's a maximal isotropic, then it's a risky locally trivial. Um, but uh, that doesn't matter. That's not going to be a problem. Okay. So I think the point is that. For a general E, firstly, lambda isn't going to exist. And secondly, even if it did, you wouldn't know whether to choose lambda or lambda dual or any or another lambda or another maximal isotropic. So you can't define this class in that way. Richard? Yeah. Um, if, if you do have an algebraic sub lambda, does that sequence split algebraically or is that non-split? No, only locally, Zariski locally. And that's how you so, prove that the quadratic structure on E is risky locally trivial. Okay, but does that doesn't give you a natural choice of the lambda versus the lambda dual if it doesn't split? I mean, am I missing something? They can't both be subs, you're saying. No, that's right. I see. So if it doesn't split, then you have a natural choice of lambda, but it might be it might not be the one that I want to take, I'll, as I'll explain. But but equally, you know, we want this class to exist for all quadratic bundles. So it's going to have to exist for the split bundle lambda plus lambda dual. And at the moment, it doesn't because I haven't told you which one to choose, lambda or lambda dual. OK, fair enough. That makes sense. OK, so, so the, and that's because we haven't used the orientation on the, in the sense of sort of three slides ago on this E yet. All of this makes sense. This slide all makes sense 
for just a plain orthogonal bundle. And square root Euler classes do not make sense for plain orthogonal bundles. They only make sense for SOR, SO to NC bundles. So what we need to do is we need to use the orientation on E to give us a, to select our lambdas. So there'll be positive lambdas and negative lambdas. So the, the orthogonal Grassmannian of maximal isotropics in C to the 2N uh, splits into two components. And um, one's the sort of positive maximal isotropics and one of the negative maximal isotropics. And so we need to, we need to be able to make that choice globally. Okay, so the way we do that is the following. Um, ah, I'll come back to the orientation in one second. So if E admits a maximal isotropic, as we've already hinted at, Adid and Graham are going to define the square root Euler class, well, they don't call it that class, um, to be up to sign the top churn class or the Euler class of the maximal isotropic. And <clears throat> up to sign, they show that this is independent of lambda. We'll come to that in one second. And the sign is important because, as we already said, if we swap lambda and lambda dual inside the direct sum, then this is an example where the sign really comes in. And we it's ill-defined. Just choosing the Euler class over the maximal isotropic is, is not defined completely. It's only defined up to sign. So here's how we define the sign. And as I say, at this point, I, I don't suggest even looking at this but just believe me that there's a way around this okay so we want to define we want to know whether we're going to call lambda positive or negative and the way we're going to do it is the following because of the exact sequence lambda goes to e goes to lambda dual you get this isomorphism between det e and det lambda tends to det lambda dual and even in that isomorphism there's various choice of signs but anyway um, and then Det lambda tensor det lambda dual is isomorphic to the trivial line bundle, the structure sheet. However, under this isomorphism, one on the right hand side does not correspond to an orientation on E in the sense of three slides ago. What it turns out is that this thing here some power of i it could be one if n is a multiple of four or something but anyway some strange negative plus or minus power of i is what corresponds to an orientation it turns out and that's just as i said before that's because this lambda and lambda dual business is writing quadratic forms in this sort of z1 zn plus one z2 zn plus two th this kind of basis um and it doesn't work well for these orientations the the basis where you take z1 squared plus z2 squared and so on, orientations are much easier to express in that basis. In this basis, there's a lot of shifting going on. There's a lot of um, replacing an e by an e plus i times e and so on. And that's what leads to this. Okay. But basically, you define your maximal isotropic to be positive if the orientation corresponds to this strange number under this isomorphism, and you define it to be negative if it corresponds to minus this strange number under this isomorphism. Okay, so there's a way of assigning, if E has an orientation, there's a way of assigning a sign to every maximal isotropic. So just believe me, and of course, it's set up to be compatible with the real picture. Okay, so remember, we had this isomorphism between our maximal isotropic and the maximal real subbundle by projection. And this uh, sign here will be positive if and only if that isomorphism preserves orientations in the usual real sense. Okay, so because lambda is a complex subbundle, it has a natural real orientation given by its complex structure. And ER. The real part of E has an orientation because my, that's equivalent to E having an orientation in the strange sense. And so, uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so positive so, lambda so, means that this is preserves orientation. Richard, I'm, I'm trying I'm trying to um, I'm trying really hard not to see the real numbers here uh, because this the, ah. the final construction is, is as algebraic, but at yeah. this point it, I 
I can't unsee them. I, I, they're, they're, I mean, this, is, this, this seems very strange to me. Uh, like at the end, is it going to be some reason why there's this, why you can, why over an arbitrary field of characteristic not two, you can somehow do this? Is that, like, it, 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 I want the real numbers to help my intuition, but not to be necessary for a definition. Uh, and that's maybe I, I should answer this later. And I'm asking Arnold. No, no, it's absolutely fine. I mean, if you've seen the real numbers, then I think it's it's just perfectly reasonable to say S O N C is basically up to homotopy the same as S O N R, and S O two N R bundles have an Euler class, and right. so that's what I'm going to produce. And so everything right. I'm doing is geared to match up with that. That's one way of seeing it. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm defining these positive maximal isotropics to be so that their natural orientation, which comes from the fact that they're complex bundles, is the same as the one on, on the real bundle. So everything's going to match up. If you don't like the real numbers, then you can just ignore all that. And all you have to know is that Firstly, if I have a maximal isotropic, I can assign a, a sign to it. If my if right. my structure group is SO two SD, then the um, the orthogonal Grassmannian of maximal isotropics, which you know point wise splits into two components, the orientability condition is that globally it splits into two components. Okay. So so this requires a further double cover to choose that orientation. So so yeah, the maximal. Let me see. The orthogonal Grassmannian of maximal isotropics. So that's some kind of bundle over my Y where I replace each fiber of E by the associated orthogonal Grassmannian. That has two, on each fiber, that has two connected components. Yes. So contract those both down, you know, take, take the, the Stein factorization. Stein factorization. Yeah. So you contract that to two points. So you now have a double cover. Yes. The condition that the bundle be an SO bundle or be orientable. Yeah. is that that double cover is actually trivial. It's just two copies of one. And, 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 but then you have to choose which one you're picking. I have which to choose which one. And if not, I'm going to get a sign. In, yeah, I'm going to change the sign in my square root. And that's the thing which I'm finding alarming because you seem to have to make a choice still. I mean, I don't see how you're getting rid that's of right. That's right. So orthogonal bundles do not have square root Euler classes. Oh, only, okay. that's, you, that's exactly what you said. Okay, yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank uh, you. Only SO bundles. And what does an SO bundle mean? It means you've chosen an orientation. You're not allowed to, if you choose the opposite one, you're going to get a sign in your square root Euler class. That just cleared up everything. Okay, that's fantastic. So that's okay. okay, great. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. So, so if you have a maximal isotropic, so you can forget everything in this talk so far. Just you have, um, an orthogonal bundle with an orientation, then a Didin and Graham, and maybe us fixing the sign, would define the square root Euler class in this way. So if your maximal isotropic is positive, you just define it to be the top churn class of the maximal isotropic. And if it's negative, you put in the sign. Okay, yeah, so that gives you a oh, uh, low. No, I just wanted to say the signs look very scary, but what's happening here is that you actually complexify something and you try to orient, and there are several natural orientations actually on something complexify. You either do like, as you said, E1, IE1, E2, IE2, and so on, or you can do E1, E2, E3, IEN. I mean, you know, there is one compatible with the direct Absolutely. sum, there is another one compatible with the splitting that you are having and with the passing to the dual, and there is another one compatible with this construction, and somehow, you know, that's actually three signs involved, and the multiplication of those three signs is what the sign you have there, because I mean, every isomorphism chooses a diff it's compatible with a different orientation procedure. I guess. Yep. Maybe. Yep. Elaine is completely correct. That's right. And um, but the two orientations you described more. differ by yeah, this that, sign. That was really helpful. Okay, great. Okay, so that's it if you admit a maximal isotropic, but in general you don't. So what they do is they they pass to a certain total bundle over the scheme Y on which there is a maximal isotropic. So if you remember the splitting principle in topology, where you replace your manifold by a certain Stiefel bundle over the manifold so that your bundle naturally splits into line bundles, this is a bit like that. 
So you, you can replace your scheme Y by essentially the orthogonal Grassmannian of the bundle E. They don't quite do that. They replace it by a certain isotropic flag variety, which is slightly more complicated. But the reason for that is that it's, it's built up iteratively from quadratic bundles. And so its cohomology is extremely easy to understand. So again, just for, you don't need to understand this slide, but just for completeness, this is what it looks like. So this is the, the bigger space. So I, I want to call it a cover, a Y tilde over Y, but it's not a finite cover, it's a bundle over Y, okay? And what it is, is you replace each fiber E by this isotropic flag variety. So you choose a flag of, you know, one dimensional, subspace, a two dimensional, all the way up to an N minus one dimensional. And you haven't gone all the, quite all the way to N yet, but this is, this is the bundle Y tilde over Y that they choose. You can imagine you can do this. This is just an algebraic construction. Um, and that has a tautological isotropic subbundle in the pullback of your original orthogonal bundle. But we, we need to go one further to En. Okay, so what we do is we pass to this um, reduction by En minus one. So we sort of pass to the orthogonal to En minus one and divide by En minus one because that's contained in the orthogonal by the isotropic condition. And then this is. These are the two remaining dimensions that I haven't dealt with. Okay. Um, so if you've never seen a construction like this, you're not going to get it very quickly. But um, the, what, what I'm left with is an SO2C bundle. Okay. And so that automatically splits as a sum of two isotropic line subbundles. We've already seen that in C2 before. So I have the C2 bundle. The quadratic form looks like x times y. And so there's two isotropics, there's X and there's Y. And so it splits as a sum of line bundles, L and L inverse, and one of them must be positive and one must be negative in the sense of the previous slide, not in the sense of positive line bundles, in the sense of positive isotropics. Okay, so we take the positive one, L, and we pull it back to E. So we add back on the thing we divided by, and we see that inside here, inside the original orthogonal bundle and this is now a maximal isotropic and it's positive so again <clears throat> don't i wouldn't worry about that slide there is a bundle over your y which is very easy to describe its cohomology is really easy to describe on which tautologically there exists a maximal isotropic sub bundle of my bundle okay and did in Graham prove that now this guy, this maximal positive isotropic, I can use its Euler class, its top churn class, and it behaves perfectly. So it descends to Y and it satisfies a whole bunch of properties that I'm about to tell you, okay? But what I have to do is I have to invert two in my coefficients. So this doesn't work unless I invert two in my coefficients. And the reason for that is the following, that there's a distinguished class made out of the fact that this iterated bundle here is a bunch of quad, is a, um, an iterated quadric bundle. So I can take the hyperplane class associated to that. And then each time I go to another quadric bundle, I take another hyperplane class and I take the appropriate power. And what I end up with is a, um, a class on y tilde, um, which is of the same degree as the fiber of y tilde to y, okay? And it has degree two n minus one, two to the power of n minus one over y. So what that means is basically you should think of is that this class is Poincaré dual to a multi-section of this bundle here. So I'm really, I'm sort of replacing y tilde by a cover, a multi-section, of y, uh, sorry, I said that dreadfully. I'm replacing y tilde by a an etal, or no, a finite cover of y W branch. And so is really this finite? Is this finite cover? This finite cover really should be seen as like there's a what is it called? Like a quadratic form over z mod two to the n preserve. Is that the? Is that the? Like, uh, is that what this? 
I'm trying I to understand, I, I should say Arnav and I in the chat are also trying to understand why once we're in the SO case already, we're still having to invert two and it makes sense of uh, uh, like the, the fault, the two, this is, these are, I guess, I, all my questions seem to be all about the same thing, which is that the, the inversion of two is not coming because you're going from O to SO. There's this additional, even once you're living fully in SO, you have to invert two. And it's, a, and it's also not coming from spin. Right. And it's not a homotopy thing. Um, because we don't need to do this if we work over the real numbers and if we work with homotopy classes and bundles. Um, it's, a, it's, um, it's, 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 it's reminiscent of a Brouwer class. I bet you could formulate it in some way. As a, it's more like a Brouwer class. So it's, you know, this, remember this bundle is not so risky locally trivial, but on this cover it will be because it has a a maximalized tropic. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to answer. I'm not going to think of a good answer to your question in real time. Okay, but, but, but the answer when it eventually comes would be some element of etal of H2, of etal cohomology with Z mod 2 coefficients that if you pull back to the corresponding gerb, then it becomes uh, uh, then. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I was hinting at that, but I, I've never managed to, I've never managed to do that. So I'm not sure if it can be expressed entirely cohomologically. I would have to, I'm sure it can. Yeah, positive, something like that. And, and then maybe one more interrupting kind of question, which is, uh, so what you, so um, you have your um, orthogonal bundle and you're, when you want to make it an SO bundle, you basically are choosing one of the maximum isotropics. Like that's the first thing that I thought was getting rid of your Z mod twos, but you're not, you're only choosing the class. You're like there's, as you said, you're doing the Stein factorization. You're choosing one of the two choices of, of those isotropics. And if you take an OG bundle over that to choose which actual maximal isotropic in the class you want to pick, that's when you get a lambda, a preferred sub-bundle, but you may not get a quotient bundle. But then the, that choice seems to involve the topology of OG, of that OG bundle. Where well, I don't mean original gangster, so, I mean... So I think I might have said something wrong earlier or confused you. Um, so there's two natural Z mod 2 bundles going on here. One is the set of orientations, maybe, let me go back. Do you remember this? So if I have an orthogonal bundle, then um, I can look at, on every fiber, I can look at the, um, the elements of Deti whose square are the inverse of this isomorphism star. And there's two of them. So I get a Z mod two bundle in that way. And that's kind of an orientation Z mod two bundle. And that's the one, that's what I should have been talking about when I was talking about orientation. Um, that's the one which is trivial for SO bundle. You know, an SO bundle is a choice of section of that Z mod two bundle. Um, and, uh, so an orientable bundle is one for which that Z mod two bundle is trivial. And an oriented bundle is one where I've trivialized it. So I've actually picked a, picked a section. Um, and what else did I want to say about that? I mean, if uh, a related issue is that if the bundle E was the risky locally trivial in the first place, then this Z mod two orientation bundle would also be the risky locally trivial and therefore it would be trivial. And therefore any risky locally trivial bundle is automatically orientable in this sense. Um, but I don't think that was your question. But then there was this, then there was this additional confusion, which was once I have an oriented bundle in this sense, so once I've picked um, a, an orientation in this sense, so a section of the Z mod two bundle, once I've done that, now I can my bundle of my orthogonal Glassmannian bundle. So my, um, that is also, its time factorization is also a different Z mod two bundle. It's not the same one. And I can ask, oh Christ, is that true? 
So now no, you're exactly no. where we're, we're confused. I that, think I'm contributing myself. I think I'm answering your question. Sorry. I think that is the same ZMOD2 bundle. I beg your pardon. Oh, yeah. I think that's the same ZMOD2 bundle. Um, and now, or a, or it's certainly, yeah, it's certainly trivial if and only if the other one's trivial. It may not be canonically the same. But yeah, but that's the same, that's the same, same class, I mean, right. Yeah, and then ah. that's right. Once, you have, once I pick this orientation, then I can pick, yeah, it is the same one. Then I can talk about positive maximal isotropics and negative maximal isotropics. And they're sections of that Stein factorization bundle. Yeah, they're the same bundle. I, uh, I've probably just confused everyone. I've certainly confused myself. <laughs> anyway, I was trying to get to. Let me, um, let me summarize. If you have an SO, an ATAR locally trivial, SO2NC bundle, then there is a notion of positivity for maximal isotropics. They can be positive or negative. And they may not exist, but on a certain cover or bundle, they do exist. Um, which is, I think, answering Ravi's question. Yeah. Okay, anyway, they do exist on this cover. And then <clears throat> what I want to do in order to choose, so I want to take my square root Euler class to be this top churn class of this maximal isotropic, this positive maximal isotropic on this uh, bundle Y tilde. And that's fine, but to do, in order to descend it, the way that Didin and Graham descend it is the following. They find a class, um, a cohomology class, but it's easier to think of it sort of Quancare dual as a, a Chow homology class as being some um, multi section of this, this bundle here. So it's some finite branch cover of Y. Okay. Um, and its degree is two to the n minus one. And so what you do is you restrict your square root Euler class to this class and then push it down. And that gives you the wrong thing precisely because of this degree two to the n minus one cover. So you have to divide by one over two to the n minus one. And so that's their definition. Okay, um, so you define the square root Euler class to be the top churn class of a maximal isotropic, but then you do this push down operation. And this is where these powers of two come in. And this is why you have to invert two in the coefficients. And this has very nice properties. So um, it, it square is indeed up to sign the Euler class. Um, it's the unique class whose pullback is the square root Euler class upstairs. And if you have any other maximal isotropic, then um, it agrees, you know, then you can take a minus one to the sign of that maximal isotropic times its Euler class, times its stop churn class. And that will agree with the thing you make from the universal maximal isotropic lambda rho. So it will agree with this square root Euler class. So it has all the properties you want. It's just you need to invert two in your coefficients because at some point you need to pass to a two to the n-fold cover, more or less. And it has a Whitney sum formula. And it's the class that I was telling you about at the start, which I motivated everything with using these maximal positive real sub-bundles, using this homotopy equivalence between SO2NC and SO2NR. Okay, so it's the same as that class when you pass to homology, when you go from chow to homology. Okay, so uh, I apologize if I, cover, if I confused you with signs, um, but this is the class, okay? So it's roughly speaking, you should think of it as the Euler class of half of your bundle, whether you think of that as the maximal real sub bundle, or you think of it as the maximal isotropic, either you should think of them as half of your bundle and you take the Euler class of that half and that's your square root Euler class up to sign. Um, right, any questions before I, now I'm going to talk about Fulton McPherson intersection theory and how we localize Euler classes to zeros of sections. 
So are there any questions before I do that? So then, so this is now, we're, we're talking about algebraic vector bundles. We're no longer talking about quadratic bundles. We come back to those in a minute. So this is a review of um, how we localize Euler classes. So suppose you, you pick a bundle with a section. If the section's transverse to the zero section, so if, it, if the graph of the section is transverse to the zero section, um, then uh, its zero locus is just Poincaré dual to the Euler class. So you you locate the Euler class to the zeros of the section. The Euler class is the zeros of the section. And even if not, even if it's not transverse, then you know what will happen is that the zeros of your section will be too big to be the Euler class. But Fulton and McPherson will give you ooh intercession theory. Um, they will give you a class supported on z the zeros of the section which when you push forward to y um, becomes the euler class so they'll, they'll even though this z is now too big to be the euler class itself there'll be a, a subclass of z which is the euler class and how do they do it they deform the graph of the section to the cone uh, a cone just means something invariant under the C star action on F, basically. Um, so what they do is they take the limit, you make the graph more and more vertical, you multiply the section by T and take T to infinity, and you take the limit in the Hilbert scheme, subscheme sense of these graphs, and you get a cone inside your vector bundle. Okay, so this is some kind of linearization of the graph around the zero locus. The zero locus is the bit you're interested in, and you're linearizing sort of perpendicular to it. And indeed, in this cone is just normal bundle of um, Z inside Y. So I try and draw a picture of this as follows. So the red thing is the graph of the section inside my bundle F, which is vertical lines, over my base Y, which is this horizontal thing. And here it's zeros. Okay, so I've got a sort of a simple zero and a double zero here. And then what I do is I take this dotted graph, which you can barely see. So I've multiplied the section by T times the section. I'm making it more and more vertical. And in the limit, what do I get? I get some vertical cone here. And I've tried to draw you a reduced cone and a non-reduced cone corresponding to this. Um, is, uh, is someone asking me a question or someone's got their microphone? Jim, is that you? Okay. So now I can intersect. Instead of taking the graph, I'm going to take the cone. And I'm going to intersect it with the zero section of Y. But that's the same thing as working just on Z and intersecting the cone inside the bundle restricted to Z with the zero section of the bundle restricted to Z. And that will give me this localized Euler class. So that's that's a, an intersection I do entirely on Z. And so it gives me a class on Z. And that's this localized Euler class um, supported on Z. And it's pushed forward to Y will be the Euler class of F. And then last thing I have to tell you is what was this zero shriek here? So this is this Giesin map. This is this intersection, Fulton McPherson intersection with the zero section of F. And how's that defined? That's essentially defined by the inverse of the Tom isomorphism. So um, because I've got a bundle over Z, I can just pull back cycles from Z to F and get non-compact cycles on F. And that's an isomorphism. Um, you know, in topology, it's more or less obvious. It's that because the equivalence between this bundle and Z. Okay. And this Giesin map is just defined to be the inverse. So what you're doing is you're taking any cycle in F restricted to Z and you're trying to make it look like a pullback. And you can do that. And the thing it's a pullback of is the um, is its intersection with the zero section. Okay. So that's how 
Fulton McPherson define this localized Euler class. And now we want to do a similar thing for isotropic sections of these quadratic bundles, these orthogonal bundles. But be before I do that, I'm going to have to use some um, something called co-section localization, which is very closely related to um, excess intersection theory. So I want to give you a sort of a trivial example of what this class might look like, okay? So um, what we're trying to imagine is that um, this section here, although it's cutting me down to Z, that's still too big. So the section is not going to be transverse to the zero section of F. So what I'm trying to imagine is a situation where Z is too big. And the reason is, let's say that the section it is a section of F, but really it's a section of a sub-bundle of F. And then there's some quotient bundle that it never sees. So this cone lies in just sort of one component of F, and then there's another component of F going off in the third direction, which I haven't drawn. Um, and roughly speaking, taking the Euler class of that additional direction um, will is what gives me this Giesing class here, is what gives me the actual class on Z. It cuts Z down to this localized Euler class. So I wanna explain how that goes. Okay, so, um, so in nice cases, um, what this cone looks like, and this is what you should think about, is it's really, it's the normal bundle to Z and Y inside F, okay? Um, so the normal directions to Z inside Y uh, I'm sort of moving my cursor in those normal directions now. You tip them upwards and see them by projection, they're isomorphic to the normal directions of Z inside this graph. And then you sort of take the limit of making that vertical and you get the normal directions here, okay? So what you end up with is a normal bundle of Z inside Y, all inside F. And the transverse case is where it's all of F and that's the case where your Euler class is just Z. But the case I'm interested in is excess intersection theory is where this normal sub bundle here is not all of F. And then you have this excess bundle, which we haven't used yet, which is the quotient. So we call that the obstruction bundle. So that's the bit of F we haven't used yet. And then in that case, your localized Euler class is not Z, it needs to be smaller. What it turns out is it's, it's the Euler class of this obstruction bundle on Z. And so that's easiest to understand when F is actually split into this normal bundle plus this obstruction bundle. And what we're trying to do is intersect just this cone here, so this summand, with the zero section. But because of this non-trivial other summand, its Euler class comes in. Okay, so the Euler class of it, so when I intersect the zero section of the obstruction bundle, Um, ah, I've written that wrong, haven't I? Sorry, that should be zero shriek ob of the zero section of ob, not ob itself. I beg your pardon. So when I, um, so my cone you see is really, it's the cone directs um, the zero section of ob, sat inside the cone directs some um, ob. And when I come to intersect it <coughs> with the zero section, what I end up doing is taking the intersection of the zero section of Ob with itself, and that is the Euler class of Ob, more or less by definition. Okay, so the, the way to understand that geometrically is to perturb this cone inside F, this, this sub-bundle here, by instead of adding zero to it, I'm going to add a transverse section of Ob to it, okay? And then I intersect with the zero section, and what do I end up with? I end up with the zeros of this transverse section of Ob. And so that's how you see you're ending up with the Euler class of Ob. Okay, so um, we're replacing this cone by this cone uh, directs on this graph and then by the limit, we're taking the limit again of that graph and that becomes eventually the pullback, it becomes a big cone, which is actually the pullback of the zeros of this additional section that I introduced. So what, all I'm trying to show you here is if, if you're the <clears throat> under nice conditions, you have this excess normal bundle, and the correct answer is to take its Euler class. If it has a section, then you just take the zero locus of that section. And let's assume that's transverse. And this is what this is trying to show, and I've probably done a bad, bad job of explaining that. But the reason I did that is because Junli 
and uh, Jung Hoon uh, Kim invented something called co-section localization, which comes up much more naturally in lots of moduli problems where this obstruction bundle doesn't have a section, but it has a co-section. So it has the dual of a section. So let me just um, summarize that. So on the last two slides, we localized first to the zeros of a section. And then when that was too big, so when the section wasn't transverse, we localized further to the zeros of a section of what was left. So that was this excess normal bundle or obstruction bundle. And then we localized to the zeros of a section of that. So we got down even further. And co-section localization does the same, but it takes not a section of ob, but a co-section. So a section of its dual. Okay, so roughly speaking, a section of the dual of the original bundle, which kills the cone. So more generally, they constructed an operator like this. So what you take a cycle in um, a bundle E and so for instance, it could be a graph or a cone or something like that. And you want to intersect with the zero section of E to get a class um, in the base. They constructed a a localization of that which lives in something smaller whose push forward is this Giesing class here. So if your cycle is annihilated by this sigma, so this is just roughly speaking is the, um, the condition that this sigma is not just a, a section of the dual of E, but it actually annihilates your cycle. So it's, um, it's in our setup, it's really in the dual of the obstruction bundle. So it's really a co-section of the obstruction bundle, not the whole bundle. Okay, but there's a, so there's a, um, a technical condition, but if you take cycles which are annihilated by this co-section, then you can look up them to the zeros of this co-section. So you, you should, but you should just think of this as being that you have this excess normal bundle, you're taking a section of its dual, and you can localize to that because that more or less represents the Euler class of the obstruction bundle. Really, it's dual, but you can put in a sign. All these things have signs. So we're going to use this co-section localization in order to localize to the zeros of an isotropic section of a quadratic bundle. Uh, what is the D of sigma here? In uh, what did I say that again? The, the D, D of sigma, what is that here? If sigma, if sigma is a co-section of the section. Did you say D of sigma? Where's D? Of Z, uh, Z, Z of sigma. Or Z of sigma, yes. The oh, sorry. The zeros of sigma. The zero locus of sigma. Okay. Yeah. It's like your uh, inverse kernel of sigma, but on Z. Or... Say that again. So what's it? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I think it makes sense. <clears throat> Okay, so we start again. So we're going to localize this did in Graham class. So we start with a, an SO and SO2NC bundle. So a bundle quadratic form orientation. And an isotropic section, that's this condition. And we construct a localized operator. So we, uh, a localized square root Euler class. Okay, so the square root Euler class um, is an operator which takes any class in Y, but we, let's just take the fundamental class of y. You can, you can restrict to any subclass by just restricting. So let's just take the fundamental class of y. Um, we get this Euler class, the square root Euler class, um, which is a co-dimension n class in y. Okay, so it's capping with this square root Euler class. We're going to produce instead a class in the zero locus z of this section whose push forward to y is the square root Euler class. Okay, and the way we do that, so if I'm, if I'm confusing you and you're, you're not completely familiar with full theory, I think just focus on this diagram here. So that's the claim. Um, and so how does it go? Firstly, we always use these um, coefficients where we invert two. Um, which allows us to sort of pass to this cover so that we've always got a maximal isotropic and then push down again later on. Okay, so we can always assume we have a maximal isotropic 
All right. So we're in that situation. And now my section of E, I can push it to be a section of lambda dual. And of course, my Euler class is just the Euler class of lambda dual. So I can choose this section in lambda dual, this P of S, I can push it down. And I can localize at first to the zeros of that. All right. So as I say here, the, the square root Euler class is more or less up to sign. It's the Euler class of my lambda dual. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this section S dual, which is this push forward of my section of E to lambda dual. Uh, and I'm going to, that's the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do Fulton McPherson localization of the Euler class of lambda dual to the zeros of this S dual. Okay. And I call the zeros of S dual Z dual. But that's not, I won't be done when I've done that. I'll have localized then just the zeros of S dual. So that's where the graph of S in E intersects lambda. It's not where S is zero. So I'm only halfway at that stage, but okay. So that's the first thing we do. So the first thing we, we just do Fulton McPherson theory. Um, we work about around this Z dual. So that's the zeros of this. S dual, that's like half of the section S. So we replace this uh, graph by this cone, just as before, we're just taking the linear version of it and we intersect it with the zero section. And so that's the Fulton McPherson localization of this, this class. But now we wanna localize further to the zeros of the whole section S, not just half of it at this S dual, okay? So we wanna use the other half of the section S. All right. And so we notice that this on Z dual, which I've now localized to, my section, well, it's, its projection to lambda dual now is zero. So actually it, it lands, it factors through lambda. So I've actually now got a section of lambda on Z dual. Okay. And so that's really a cosection because that's a map from thinking of a section of lambda as a map from lambda dual to O. It's really a cosection. And the isotropic condition, which I haven't used notice until this point, the isotropic condition becomes that this cone here, which remember was a limit of graphs of isotropic sections, this cone lies in the kernel of the, this cosection here. Okay, so that's the condition that you need to apply um, Keem and Lee's cosection localization. And so what that does is it allows me to localize further to the zeros of the cosection. Co and that's the zeros of this sort of other half of the section. So the part of S in lambda. And so actually it allows me to localize all the way to the zeros of the original section S. And so I take this keenly localized operator and I get a class in the Chow homology of Z, where Z is the zeros <clears throat> excuse me, of the isotropic section. And it's pushed forward. Everything's got these funny coefficients with a two inverted. And it's pushed forward to um, Y is the original uh, Adidian Graham class. And similarly, um, importantly for the moduli application, we also get a kind of um, square root Giesin map. So if you have an isotropic cone in your SO bundle, uh, then there's an operator taking cycles in that cone to lower dimensional cycles in the zero section. Um, and it, I appreciate I may have lost a lot of people. So just to bring things back down to earth, if the cone factors through a maximal isotropic, so that's a, it won't do in general, but if it does, so if it already lives in kind of half the bundle, then this is just the ordinary Giese map for that isotropic. Um, so one thing I completely forgot to say earlier on is isotropic sections do not in general live in maximal isotropic subbundles, unfortunately. If they did, then this localization I did earlier would just be the usual Fulton McPherson localization of that section to its zeros considered as a section of the maximal isotropic. So that's maybe how you should think of this class that we're defining. 
um, but it's it's more general than that. And then again, just briefly, uh, I tell you the definition of the map, but we've more or less already done it in what we've already worked out. So um, on this cone, you can pull back the bundle that it lives in, so this D here, and that has a tautological section because the cone lived in E. So um, <clears throat> at a point of the cone, you're a point of E, and therefore that gives me a section of the pullback of E. Okay, And this is isotropic almost by definition, and its zero locus is precisely the zero section of the cone. So you just take the um, localized Euler class for, um, from the previous slide, applied to ah, that should be the pullback pi star of E on this cone, and it localizes everything to the zero section, which is precisely what we want. Okay, so I've probably lost lots of people, but um, there's basically most of the things that you're used to for Euler classes, Giesing classes, Fulton McPherson intersection theory, there are kind of square root versions for these quadratic bundles. And they have good properties. There's a Whitney sum formula. There's um, the compatibility of um, under you know as I as I um, deform the graphs the cone uh, the two constructions deform to each other one becomes the other and so on. Okay, so um, what time is it? Wow, Christ, I'm sorry. I should uh, I should very quickly hurry up and finish. Um, okay, so uh, very quickly, what does this have to do with bundles on Calabi R fourfolds or sheaves on Calabi R fourfolds? It's the following. So you take a Calabi R fourfold, um, fix a churn character, take moduli of Gizika semi-stable sheaves of that churn character, and uh, you get a moduli space. And I'm going to assume throughout that stable and semi-stable coincide. So that means that the uh, moduli space uh, is projective. And it's when you sort of linearize the moduli space and do its deformation theory around a point F, um, what does it look like? So the deformations are given by X1, the obstructions are given by X2, and say duality gives you an isomorphism from X2 to its dual. And it's a symmetric isomorphism because two is even. And so really it's a quadratic structure. So it gives you a quadratic form on X2. And that's why I'm interested in quadratic bundles. And it gives you higher obstructions, so X3. And again, by say duality, they're actually dual to X1. And because there are higher obstructions, you don't get a virtual cycle in the usual way. And then there's even higher obstructions, but they don't really um, feature. Um, so what this has to do with the rest of the talk is that morally, the moduli space, you should think of it as the zero locus of an isotropic section of an orthogonal bundle over a student space. Okay, and um, this moral is actually so this is how you should think of it. This moduli space is the zeros of a section, isotropic section, of a quadratic bundle over a smooth ambient space, A. And this is actually globally true for gauge theory reasons. If you allow A to be infinite dimensional and the bundle to be infinite dimensional, but uh, we're algebraic geometers. So, um, and it, but it's actually locally true as well. If you look at the sort of Kuranishi model, the local model of the moduli space, it's cut out inside an open set in, it's is a risky tangent space, X1, uh, by a section of the bundle with fiber X2. And that section, I told you that that, that bundle can be made to be quadratic by say duality. And it turns out the section can be made to be isotropic. So it's locally true, this model. And uh, if you're into obstruction theory and virtual cycles like me, that it's just saying the obstruction theory looks like this. So um, this is the tangent. This is the cotangent to the ambient space. This is my quadratic bundle. And this is the tangent. And this is really dual to itself. This, this whole thing is dual to itself, this whole complex, which is just say duality for this complex here. And because this isn't two term, you can't apply the usual. This is not what's called a perfect obstruction theory. Confusingly, it is a perfect complex, but it's not two term. 
and so you can't apply um, Li Tian or Vera Tanteki. So what we're going to do is try and halve the complex by throwing one of these t's away and replacing e by lambda. Oh, and by the way, you can orient it by work of Joyce, um, Sow, and Gross. So actually, it's an SO bundle. Okay, but you can't patch these local models. This model I drew here is not, it's just a moral model. It's only locally true. They don't patch together. But what you are able to patch is sort of the linearized version of it. So what you do is you take the limits of all these graphs and you get a cone as usual, an isotropic cone inside a quadratic bundle. This can be patched together, all right? So what the, what the deformation theory ultimately gives you is on your moduli space, a quadratic bundle with an isotropic cone inside it. And so you can define the virtual cycle to be our square root Giesen map applied to this cone. Um, so you should think, yeah. So, so you shouldn't take the Li Tian Berem Fanteki virtual cycle here, which would be this. That would correspond to sort of stupidly truncating the obstruction theory by just throwing away the first term or the last term. Um, and that isn't quasi isomorphism invariant. It gives the wrong virtual dimension. It jumps from point to point. It's, it's really a terrible thing to do. But what we're doing is roughly halving it. So what we're doing is you should think of, it's not true, but what you should do is you should think of that we're throwing away one term, this piece, and we're replacing E by a maximal isotropic in E. That's not quite true because the cone doesn't lie in a maximal isotropic. If it does, then everything's... But that's roughly what we're doing. And we're trying to intersect with the, max, the zero locus of the maximal isotropic instead of the whole zero locus V. We only want it to sort of take half of E. That's what's going on here. Um, and Borisov Joyce intersect uh, ish with um, the real maximal sub bundle. And we can actually prove uh, that. So they're taking a different half of the obstruction complex. They're halving E by taking this real maximal sub bundle. And uh, we can prove that their result is the same as ours. Okay. Um, so uh, I should uh, I should probably finish. I was going to talk about the K-theory version, but um, let me just tell you there's a K-theory version. I can, I guess you have the slides or I can send the slides. Um, and there's a Riemann rock relating the K-theory and the cohomology classes. So the virtual structure sheaf and the virtual class are related by a virtual Riemann rock formula. But the last thing I'll just end with is just the statement of the torus localization formula. So if a group, if a torus acts, then we have a localization formula for our virtual cycle and for this virtual structure sheaf. Uh, and that means they're much more computable. So whereas the Borisov Joyce classes can't be computed, these classes can because there's a localization formula. Okay, sorry, sorry I ran over so much. I'm not sure. That, that's Ravi's fault for asking questions. Always happy to be <laughs> blamed for that in Richard. But, uh, great. So let's let's uh, unmute and thank thank Richard for uh, for a very inspiring talk. And now, are there are there yeah are there more questions? I always have more, but uh, do other people have more questions? Just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask if you feel like it. Okay, then I, great, so I get to ask, uh, great, so no one, uh, uh, I guess I could force everyone else to be muted and just ask my own questions. But, so Richard, in the, um, uh, let me divide your talk into sort of maybe three pieces. The, th uh, the third is the application, but the, of the first two, I get the, uh, um, uh, I get the sense that probably most people would agree that of the first two parts, one of the two is the really fancy part. Uh, and, but I, I, I want to ask whether it's not the part that looks fancy. That I feel like the the real um, enlightenment came from the first part on on sort of linear algebra done uh, done done well. Uh, actually, where did you go? I can't see you anymore. Okay. Yeah, you're I can't see you. Ah, oh, good. Now I see you. Great. Ah, great. No, I, uh, great. So 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 I feel like the real insight came in the first half where you're essentially saying you can get at these classes um, by where you don't have choices of isotropic subbundles by essentially doing this very clever trick, which requires moving to a, a two cover, a high power two cover, 
uh, doing your work upstairs and then pushing forward. And then even the things you do with the co-section localization versus Fulton McPherson, you could just do the same thing with the complement by in effect choosing a, comp a complementary, um, I mean, it's maybe unnatural from the point of, point of view of where you happen to have uh, naturally one um, isotropic and then the other comes as a quotient. But you could just as well choose the, the other one as well, do the same trick, pull back to the cover, do all your work in the, in the cover upstairs where you're just using off the shelf Fulton McPherson, all the constructions, localization, everything you want, Whitney sum, everything just works up there and you just push down, divide by a power of two. So like, like I, 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 is it, I, I mean this as praise, not, not an insult, <laughs> but like I feel like the, the really, the, the thing that makes everything transparent was in the first third and everything else used fancy things, but really just came as a consequence yep. of that point of view. Is that a, is that a, uh, I, I guess more or less, but even if you, I mean, you're gonna, are, are you saying you could, you could do without the co-section localization or no? Yeah, there, I mean, there's no super advantage because it's just as easy or hard as Fulton McPherson. It's just a, it's a very wise separate thing to do. But in this case, I think you can do without it. Not that there's a real advantage in that, but you could do without it by doing your same trick twice in, in effect. That, that essentially what you're, uh, I mean, the way I, I interpret, uh, right, I feel like the first part of the talk is something which in retrospect, when someone might say like, is quote obvious once you say it, but certainly yeah. it was not obvious before you said it to me, uh, that you, that you, that you, uh, that essentially you're interpreting uh, the edited and gram you're, you're, well, everything about your the first part was by noting that you could actually in effect choose a um, add the additional choice of a Lagrangian uh, not Lagrangian yeah. of a of a isotropic uh, yep. subspace and uh, Nicholas Kuhn in the comments described it in like very down to earth terms of trying to do Gram Schmidt and then having to take a bunch of square roots. So you add that data in, which gives you a, a Stein factorization, and then which doesn't add anything complicated, followed by uh, a, sorry, a finite two cover, power of two cover, yep. uh, and then uh, and then do all your work upstairs, where you have an honest vector bundle and honest sections of stuff, because that's what you've you've constructed something with. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of like taking questions about GLN and saying, oh, let's use the splitting principle and pull back to a flag bundle. Just do all your stuff with line yeah. bundles upstairs and push down, and then all you have to understand are line bundles, and then everything else falls for free. So it seems to me like your first third was like the really powerful, like that's but, where. Um, was. Let let me let me object to that slightly, and then maybe you tell me how you would get around this objection. So, what's really important for moduli spaces is not just like an Euler class; it's this localized guy, right? Yeah. You really but that's all free too. That's but that's all okay too. Right. That's no, you, you do the localized Euler class upstairs cool. uh, uh, and push it forward. I agree. It's localized on the push. But the, the, the problem here is that if you, I think what you're advocating is that you want to split it. You want upstairs. You want not just a maximal isotropic, but you also want the dual. So you want a splitting of e into lambda plus lambda dual because then i would agree you could use fulton intersection theory fulton mcpherson intersection theory twice maybe let me separate my point into, well, well maybe let me separate my point let me separate my point into two and that way your objection is to the less important part of the two the first is uh, yeah. maybe don't do away with co-section localization yet just go upstairs you have co-section localization which at this point we're starting to think of as being the thing you would learn when you learn Fulton intersection theory anyway, like that is an added, it's like kind of a, so, and then you can just yeah. work upstairs and then all ends. Uh, so the point of view of the first third makes everything work, just work. And then the added potential bonus, which is a very mild bonus uh, uh, of getting rid of co-sectional localization is a second, uh, uh, is a second, uh, uh, oh, Nicholas is just reminding me that I'm teaching and he's seeing in three minutes, but this is just too interesting. So Nicholas, maybe <laughs> go to, <laughs> if you can go to the class and I'll, I'll 
and, and I'll be I'll, and we'll end very abruptly very soon. Uh, but this is the beginning of an interesting. Uh, we, okay, we should continue talking about this. But I feel like the bulk of uh, okay, that's the, that's the second question. We can get rid of the cross-sectional leverage. I need to think through a little bit. Um, I, maybe the cost is too high. I mean the uh, because in the application you do come with the sub for free. You don't need to add that in because it's given to you. Right. Uh, uh, and that's what, that's a good reason to stick with this point of view. But the, but your more general theory of the square root Euler class in the case where you don't have an automatic sub, but your theory is just going to work perfectly fine as well. All you're doing is you are in essence taking the first third or first half of your talk and uh, using that insight, going to the cover, working upstairs, localizing, up, doing all, all the work upstairs and just pushing the answer downstairs and dividing right. by a power of two. Yeah, which is all genius and nothing to do with us. I mean, that's all it did in Graham or it's probably Fulton, to be honest, um, who suggested it to them. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, yeah, it's it. Um, yeah, but it wasn't, but it wasn't, I mean, again, I don't, I don't mean this as a trivializing. I, I, no, I, I, and again, I mean, like, if it were so obvious, they would have said it that way. And now I think it's, that's why I like this talk, because I think I, it made something so, obvious. So yeah, I guess I guess it did ingrain and didn't quite nail a sign, but that's more or less everything else was was in what uh, they did. Um, uh, I buy and I buy that it's implicit there, but it's not. I, that never okay. That's a philosophical point that it's not. Uh, it was not obvious to me. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I was. Uh, I, don't, sure. I don't think it's to be obvious to them. Sure. No, no. I, 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 sorry. I, I, I mean this. I, I hope that didn't come across as saying what you're doing is trivially a consequence of what they did. Yeah. But it is. But it is a trivial consequence, I think, of understanding what they did the right way, which right. people didn't, or else they would have. They would have said this before. So. Um, and now well, maybe, maybe I apologize. An application. I mean, we have yeah. this application to modulate spaces, so we were forced to do it. Yeah, but it's the right way um, even to do right. what they were doing. It was the right way to, maybe we'll follow up later. Uh, you may enjoy watching the Discord chat and going to see what we talked about. But I feel like other special, other exceptional groups as well, this looks susceptible to this point of view. This seems really nice. Well, let me now maybe apologize because I should run or I will yeah. be fired from my job uh, for not showing up at my class. But this is a great talk. Uh, everyone, if you don't mind, I will actually have successfully passed ownership to other people. So you're welcome to stay and chat with Richard if he's willing to stay. Uh, but let's unmute one more time and thank Richard for actually, for me at least, a very inspiring.